Hello and welcome to Colleague 7 Sprint Review for 19.12.02. This will cover the work undertaken between the 10th of December to the 6th of January. Our sprint goal for this sprint has been to deliver a series of infrastructural updates that will improve performance and consistency when using Colleague 7. Looking at the high level items and to explain further, in this sprint, we've been able to deliver updates to our background service, specifically around its management of bulk mailing. Previously, when bulk mailing, it would be managed via a queuing mechanism, whereas moving forwards, processing will occur in multiple threads on the service. So processing will be achieved in parallel. This is all with a view to improving speed and avoiding delays when sending emails. We've enhanced our error logging on the background service so that we now have access to more specific information and this will greatly help with reducing the time it takes to establish the causes of any potential issues in future. We've rewritten the way the GDPR consent notifications are handled. This is to improve its management of larger volumes of data. There has been an assessment of the SQL scripting which is called when loading records and several updates have been made following this review. Along with that, there are a number of dev items raised for future sprints. We've added extra retry loops into the email workflows. This is to assist in scenarios where MS Graft, which is Microsoft uh, Office 365's API, uh, is unresponsive when we try to pass them the email. Uh, often this is simply due to traffic and a simple retry in the code will allow the email to be sent. Um, we now do this try for three times before declaring an error. We've added uh, multi-selection on skill criteria when searching. I'll give a demo on this shortly. We've investigated and begun the work needed to implement a right-click menu um, to Colleague 7, essentially allowing the relevant workflows and settings to be available as an option when pressing right-click within the UI. There will be progress to report on this in the next sprint review. We've updated the profile picture on the candidate company and contact records so that you can add or update the picture by either pressing on the image or via drag and drop. There is now an email signature template which can be assigned to users records. This uses merge fields from the user record and allows an administrator to update one email signature template and it affects all users using that signature. I'll give a demo on this shortly. We've added the website field to the candidate record. We've added ownership as a column option when viewing contacts on a company record. We've added some extra don't show this again options to several of the alert messages. We've added a new user group permission on the authorization to accept or reject an offer. We've update, updated the user group permissions area so that the permissions are categorized and are given some description on their purpose. And as a final point, we've updated the archived and deleted records so that all on context menu toolbar options are hidden. This ensures users cannot run workflows against archived records. We'll now go for a brief demonstration on the key features from this sprint. So we now have an email signature template that's available within Colleague 7. Um, this is set up uh, within the admin area under templates. So on selection of templates, um, you'll be given, uh, you'll obviously have a list of all the available email and document templates that you have, but under uh, new template, you'll now have an additional type called email signature. If you select email signature, the uh, scope will um, default to the uh, user merge uh, scope um, as it's obviously going to be pulling on uh, fields from the user record. Um, you can assign obviously a description um, and then as you're creating the email signature, you can then assign um, these different uh, merge fields, the name, the job title, telephone number, uh, known as and uh, email address. And what you can um, end up with is uh, essentially a, a, a list of established email signatures that are associated with uh, obviously the teams that you have or the businesses that maybe you have that are using the system. So um, I have an email signature that I've set up here um, and then that can obviously be uh, assigned against a, um, a user record. So if we go to users, what you'll see on selection of a user, I select uh, this user here, um, we can assign a user uh, an email signature 
and you can see there the ion signature is, is, is applied and the um, the fields that are associated with the ion signature get merged in um, so the ion signature becomes ready. Uh, that can be done by administrator at a user level, but also um, if you're in uh, user settings, uh, personal settings for, for the individual user, there's a template selection. This is dependent on whether or not they have that uh, user group permission um, option available to them. So just go back to um, user group permissions just to highlight that. If I go back to user group permissions, and if we select use group uh, within uh, global, there's an option here of edit email signatures. So providing that has been granted, um, the individual user uh, will be able to assign uh, their own email signature from the email signature template. Or obviously, if no email signature is assigned, they can just type in their own. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, essentially what this uh, means is that you can have um, an email signature uh, that's uh, standardized across the business and then you only have to edit that email signature in one place uh, because it's it's calling on this email signature uh, when it's drawing it so um, if you wanted to then um, edit the template in any way that that edit of that uh, email signature template is then going to update all of the email signatures uh, also all of the um, yeah all of the email signatures that are assigned throughout the system against individual users they'll get that update so it's a it's a more generic way of deploying an email signature across the system, and then obviously when you're in a, a record and you hit email, um, obviously the email signature that's associated with the user is obviously going to come through um, into the email. Uh, so that's um, email signatures uh, or email signature templates specifically uh, within this sprint. So just to touch on a few of the other um, updates that have also been made. Um, firstly, within any of the searches on the skill criteria section of the search, what you can now do is um, essentially what we applied uh, for the system um, in the previous sprint, which is the option to hold down shift or control um, and uh, essentially be able to do that within the skill criteria now when you're selecting uh, uh, skill criteria. So um, you can now... Uh, select a range, uh, you can select a batch individually and uh, and obviously add those um, into skill criteria, just as you can now do that um, within uh, entity records in the skills area. So that, that just completes the update of skills in that you can now select ranges and, and or, or select uh, multiple um, individual records and obviously include uh, selecting parents in there as well. Um, and that just allows you to build up a uh, a, a skill criteria search um, in a more faster way um, than previously you could. Um, moving into the uh, candidate record, although this uh, update also affects the candidate company and contact, and that's to do with the profile picture. So the previously to populate the profile picture, you had to go into the documents tab, you had to upload a picture, you had to sign it as a specific document type of profile picture, uh, and then it would appear. Uh, we've now updated it so that the profile picture either responds to a single click um, you can click on the profile picture and it'll open up um, a, uh, a an open um, dialog uh, box for you to select an image. Um, or what you can do um, is uh, drag and drop as well. So if I just quickly go to some, if I get a picture. and if I drag that into here um, you can now basically drag pictures into um, the profile image and it will just update um, so that's just a, a time saver um, in terms of um, updating profile pictures within the system um, the other element to uh, mention is that we have added the website field uh, to the candidate record so uh, this works in the same way that the website field works on the company um, as well um, in that you have obviously the address and then you have a, a button here and if you uh, obviously hit that it'll open up a new tab and take you to the web address that you've entered. Um, so some minor updates there. The next point to cover is on the company record on the contacts tab and that's that we've added uh, the option for ownership to be shown within the contacts area. So uh, when you're in a company on the contacts tab um, off the options list you can select here where you can select which columns you view on the contacts table. Uh, you'll have ownership there as an extra column that you can tick. Um, and then if you go back to the, uh, if you tick that and go back to the uh, company um, on the contacts tab, you're going to see the uh, ownership column appear. So in terms of the 
Um, so in terms of how that how that then views, if you have multiple um, owners, um, what, what it will do is it will display, obviously, the uh, owner within there. And if there are multiple owners, it will separate each owner uh, with a comma. And then you can ov obviously um, mouse over um, that, that owner and it will display in a tooltip the full owners. Um, but as an example, if we went into um, this contact and under owner, we assigned um, a multiple of... Um, uh, owners and I'm back over here if I just refresh that And I believe it was here, yeah, Mike Granger. So you can see that the ownership is there and that um, obviously all the owners have been assigned um, against that contact. And obviously you can see the owners there. So that's the ownership column added to the contacts table. Next point to cover is just on the um, don't show this again alerts options that have been added um, in this sprint. Um, so running as an example, running from the uh, requirements, um, running the search for candidates, and then we'll, we'll select uh, skill and postcode and we hit OK there. Um, what we've done is added some more options where you've got the ability to, to not show the alert again. So as an example, when you're running this workflow, you get this alert, which gives you just a bit of um, informational text um, about the workflow. Um, but once you've, if you've used this workflow multiple times, you, you don't need to see this every time. So um, what you now have is an option that says don't show this again. You can tick that. Um, hit OK there and then obviously it won't come back again. Um, so if I go back to the requirement and then rerun that workflow, um, that won't be there. Um, we've added this workflow to the, uh, the document edit area, um, the search for candidates, the search for requirements from a candidate record um, and um, also the spec CV, the multiple spec CV, we've added it there as well. Um, and we'll continue to add it in areas where um, it's it's not necessary for you to see that dialogue uh, multiple times um, in, in an effort to obviously uh, save clicks for you. Um, so you can see that by running that workflow again now, um, yeah, that, that, that obviously that option is not there anymore. Um, and these are also user settings. So you've got a section called alerts and you can see there you've got um, different um, alert options um, that uh, obviously have yes or no based on whether or not you want to show them. So um, yeah, there's an extra, uh, don't show this again, alerts that we've added. Um, to the um, system as part of the sprint. Another thing we were able to do as part of this sprint was tidy up the uh, user group permissions area. So then user group permissions, uh, what we've now done is uh, categorize you on selection of a user group permission. Um, we've now categorized the user group permissions um, and we've added in a description. Um, so it just gives a little bit more context uh, on the purpose behind each permission um, as this list uh, continues to grow based on all the different configurations that we apply um, and obviously that, that, that's set to continue. So um, we've, we've obviously grouped those out now. So um, the user group permissions area now have um, obviously grouping assigned uh, against the permissions and obviously descriptions against each of the uh, user group permissions. Um, the next point to cover is just on the placement um, or on offers more to the point, and that's that there is now a user group permission on the ability to accept or reject offers. So um, on a uh, pending offer, you obviously have this accept or reject um, offer. If you want to restrict that to specific users, um, then you can set that to no access. And then if we refresh this offer, you'll see that the accept and reject um, is essentially grayed out. And on mouse over, you can see there it says um, you do not have permission to accept or reject offers. Um, so there's just um, a, an extra use group permission option um, if you wanted to lock down that functionality. Uh, but that's set to full access as standard. Uh, but that's use group permissions area, and that's the extra permission with regards to um, accepting or rejecting offers. The last point to cover is just the updates that have been made with regards to archived records and deleted records in that we have hid the toolbar options against the records. Uh, so this is, as an example, if I go into an um, archived record, with an app and if I um, go to say this candidate record which I know to be archived um, what you'll see is that the um, options to uh, run any workflow have essentially been stripped out of the record um, 
So in terms of the tool bar, you obviously you get the confirmation on, on when the record was archived, but you'll notice that um, the, all the functionality essentially has been taken out of the record. Um, and it's been done essentially because um, some of that functionality is prone to error on the basis that the record is archived. Um, so as such, it shouldn't be uh, available as an option. So it's something that we wanted to do um, to ensure that when you go into a, an archived record, essentially what the options you have there is uh, an option to unarchive the record, um, or you've got the option to add to lists because you are still able to build lists um, of archived records if you want to refer back to them. So uh, that option remains there, but you've got the unarchive option, add to list option, and then go back. Um, if you're in a deleted record, the option is literally just go back. Uh, because obviously it's uh, it's a deleted record and, and that obviously ensures that there's not a scenario of workflow being run against an archived record. Uh, so that's the update we made there. As always, if you have any queries or feedback, please get in touch. I'll be keen to hear from you. Also, for those using Colleague 7, feel free to submit your enhancement requests via the support team or directly to me using the above email address. The next video will be the sprint plan for 20.01.01. .01 .01. And as always, that will contain a high level overview on the items we intend to work on during that sprint. Thanks for watching.